Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight in BC, for most non essential activities, you will soon need vaccine proof. This is putting us on the right path. With cases rising, schools opening, and fall on the way, how worried should you be? Also tonight, health care hits on the campaign trail. The leader of the Conservative Party came out to support for profit health care. I 100% support our public and universal health care system. To survive a persistent prairie drought, heartbreaking auctions. The hardest part is that you're seeing the fabric of our communities unravel. And the joy of a reopened border. I pulled over to collect myself. A pandemic reunion, the power of friendship. This is The National. Well, with an election call during a pandemic, health care was certain to be a key issue. And as we'll show you in just a few minutes, that sure played out on the campaign trail today. Less certain, of course, was how the pandemic itself would play out. Today, by three measures, it seems to be going the wrong way. On August the 1st, Canada reported just under 1,100 daily new cases. Today, it's more than 2,000. The rolling seven-day average is up two, from 776 on August 1st, to more than 2,300 today. And then there's that crucial number, hospitalizations. The most recent data show they've gone from 450 to more than 800. Now, BC knows that trend line full well. It has one of the country's highest per capita infection rates. So today, new measures to fight back, including a type of vaccine passport. Rene Filipponi looks at how it'll work, when it's coming, and what people are saying about it. Outside one of Vancouver's mass vaccination clinics is the kind of crowd that's backing the province, happy to see restrictions for the unvaccinated. I think for the safety for everybody still, that's our main goal, right? I think everybody just has to get used to the fact that we have to do this, and then everybody will get over it, I guess. <laughs> Today's announcement means a BC vaccine card will soon be required for nearly everything deemed non-essential. This is our way of getting through this next phase of the pandemic that we've been dealt and to make sure that we can go through the fall with safely reopening schools. The vaccine card will be needed to attend concerts, restaurants, casinos, theaters, even gyms and organized events like weddings. There will be no exemptions except for children under 12. British Columbians need to know that this is the first time anything like this has ever been tried. Uh, there may be bumps along the way, but we're very confident. The hope is this move will convince more people to get vaccinated, but there are concerns the rules are too wide sweeping. Uh, from my perspective, the most surprising one is that there's no uh, accommodations provided for people who um, have medical reasons for not, not being vaccinated. What rest of you are doing for the Bolognese? But for celebrated Canadian chef David Hawksworth, this is exactly what he's been waiting for and hopes it will bring stability to his industry. We want to have, provide a great place uh, for people to work and we want uh, a safe environment for our customers to come into. And uh, this, is, uh, this is putting us on the right path. He acknowledges the policy will create challenges for staff dealing with people who don't support vaccine passports. But he is okay with that. If people don't want to get vaxxed, then I really don't want them here. <laughs> so it's, it's a simple equation. Okay, so Renee, give us a sense of how this will all work. I mean, the, the rollout, the BC vaccine cards themselves, what are people looking at? Well, Andrew, first up, the government will provide these vaccine cards for people to download on their phones. And if they show up at a patio like this, they will have to present that card along with their ID. They're also coming up with an alternative, a secure plan for people who don't have phones. Then there will be two steps. The first happening September 13th, where people will need to have that first vaccination at least seven days earlier. Then by mid-October, people will need to be double vaccinated. Now, Premier John Horgan says this is only meant to be in place for a little while to bridge the gap until the federal government has come up with its own vaccine passport strategy and technology. Andrew? Okay, Renee Filipponi in Vancouver tonight. Thanks. Now, Ontario's government hasn't mandated proof of vaccination for non-essential activities, but today many businesses and attractions took that step themselves. One even threw in a bonus, a shot of vaccine. Stephen D'Souza has the details. 
In Hamilton today, the CFL team held a vaccination clinic so fans, especially worried parents and their kids, could get their shot. I sort of live in this land of the unexpected, being prepared for anything to change last minute. It's just nerve-wracking to see as much as they try to stay apart and do the right things. It's difficult when they're kids. The Tiger Cats today joined a parade of businesses, including Mervish Theatre Productions, the Toronto International Film Festival, and the Toronto Blue Jays, announcing they'll require proof of vaccination or a negative test to attend. The push comes as Ontario sees its highest case count since June. 70% of those testing positive haven't had a single vaccination shot. We have to push vaccines amongst those who don't have them, and we have to use mask wearing incentives for people indoors. Those two things alone will keep the ICUs from being over um, burdened, I think, I hope. To reach the unvaccinated, Toronto closed four mass vaccination sites, instead targeting specific neighbourhoods. This man brought his two sons. I got vaccinated before them, but to convince them, it was, it was a difficult situation. The challenge is that while the unvaccinated group is getting smaller, rising cases and hospitalizations are still a risk. That small number of unvaccinated are more likely to get infected now than they would have been earlier. So that is the fear. Today, yet another reminder of how quickly things can turn. Officials east of Toronto declared an outbreak at a basketball tournament held earlier this month. So far, they've traced 20 cases, but say more than 7,000 people attended over five days. With participants coming from across Ontario and elsewhere, they're asking anyone involved to get tested. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. The Canadian Football League says nine Edmonton Elks players have tested positive for COVID-19. Their game against the Argonauts on Thursday here in Toronto has now been postponed. Players and staff are isolating and the team's practice facility has been shut down for seven days. Two maritime provinces released back-to-school plans today. Nova Scotia students should be back in class on September the 7th. Masks will be required until the province reaches 75% vaccination rate. In PEI, kids will also be back in the classroom, but with no mask mandate. That province says it wants school to be as close to normal as possible. Now in Quebec, most children will return to classes beginning next week. But for older students attending CEGEP, which is typically two years of schooling after grade 11, the academic year began today. Alison Northcott shows us what their first day looked like without the kind of strict measures we've become used to. For the first time in nearly 18 months, this college is fully reopened and the campus is coming back to life. I'm not used to it anymore. Seeing so many people and I was like, hey, I know all these people. I get to like meet people so easily. Now we're going to have like more of a normal college experience that like being online, like on Zoom, didn't really allow for. Everybody will have to wear a procedural mask. Inside, hand washing and masks are mandatory, but distancing in classrooms, some with as many as 40 students, is not. And while vaccination is encouraged, it's not required for students or staff. There is a concern uh, since the end of the spring and all through the summer, we have been uh, promoting uh, the, the importance of young people in that demographic, 18 to 30, to get vaccinated. Part of that push includes this pop-up vaccine clinic on campus. That we're talking about an age demographics that is actually the least vaccinated. Dr. Donald Vin says that, plus the Delta variant, create a big risk that needs to be mitigated. We should really have maximal safety measures to protect all of our students while they're in school so that they can focus on, on their education and on their social activities rather than ang ang being anxious about whether their the neighbor in the class is actually infecting them. First year student Omar Alam is happy to be on campus in person, but he's not convinced it will last. With all these people, I think it's going to spread very easily, especially with the new variant. I'm expecting to be online soon, but uh, I'm enjoying it while I can. Some elementary and high schools reopen later this week. So far, the province has said masks in class and class bubbles will no longer be required. But the health minister says that could change. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal.
So change, just about the uh, only constant in this pandemic. And, and I just want to take a moment to underline a big thing that, that has changed when it comes to the way we look at daily case counts. So look at these numbers from British Columbia. Cases are going up, but what we're not seeing yet, anyway, is a big spike in hospitalizations, which was the case you see in the middle of the graph back when many more people were unvaccinated. Same thing with Ontario's numbers. During the last big wave, we saw an increase in hospitalizations as cases went up. But the silver lining with this latest wave, this fourth wave, is that hospitalizations are still low. So how concerned should we be with Delta circulating? Well, infectious diseases specialist Dr. Zane Chagla here to help us understand what the takeaway ought to be. Dr. Chagla, how do you read it? Yeah, so I, I think the big thing here is not all cases are created the same. A case in an unvaccinated person particularly an unvaccinated adult, although we know kids can get sick, um, you know, is one where that track between case, hospitalization, death, ICU is really there. The one fundamental difference we have now, though, is a case in a vaccinated person, particularly a young, healthy vaccinated person, is very, very unlikely to lead to a hospitalization. So what we're looking at is that balance of how many unvaccinated cases are there going to be particularly in, in adults versus how many vaccinated cases they're going to be, which aren't going to be represented in healthcare specifically. Very quickly, how, how likely is another lockdown? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of tools we can pull. I mean, mandates and, and many other things, capacity limits. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult to lock down when 75% of the population that's eligible did the thing that's going to keep them out of hospital and is mm. fundamentally at a different risk of this disease than others. Okay, Dr. Chagla, thank you so much. No problem. Healthcare played big on the campaign trail today. The Liberals laid out their plan to give provinces billions more in funding. But as David Cochran shows us, that announcement had to share the spotlight with a troublesome tweet. At a campaign stop in Halifax, Justin Trudeau pitched the Liberal health care plan and warned Canadians about the plan of Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. In the middle of the pandemic, the leader of the Conservative Party came out to support for-profit health care. That's just unacceptable. But Trudeau's warning was undercut after Twitter put warning labels on tweets by Chrystia Freeland for what Twitter called deceptive editing of a video of O'Toole discussing private health care. An edit that left in phrases like this. We have to find public-private uh, synergies. But cut out phrases like this. And make sure that universal access remains paramount. The Conservatives have written election watchdogs to ask for an investigation. But as the Liberals hoped, O'Toole had to answer questions about private health care. Let me be perfectly clear. I 100% support our public and universal health care system. The spat is one thing, the contrast another. Trudeau is promising $10 billion in conditional support to the provinces to clear up the medical backlog caused by COVID and hire thousands of nurses and family doctors. 7,500. That's how many family doctors, nurses and nurse practitioners we're going to help hire. O'Toole's offer comes with no strings attached, a 6% increase in health transfers to provinces every year. We're giving an additional $60 billion to secure that public health care system. What's missing from the Liberal platform is how much Trudeau would increase annual health transfers. O'Toole has made clear what he would give the premiers. Trudeau says he's willing to negotiate once the election is over. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the NDP leader was in Quebec today talking about the health of the planet. Tom Perry has the highlights. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh took the game to his main rival's home turf today, visiting a board game shop in the Montreal riding Justin Trudeau has held since 2008. Singh says he wants voters to know they do have a choice. His focus today was climate change. He offered few specifics, but he vowed to eliminate federal subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, including current programs to clean up orphan oil wells and help resource companies adapt to a low carbon economy. We want to make it really clear. New Democrats want to end those subsidies and we want to invest directly into creating jobs and directly into protecting the environment. The NDP was reduced to just one seat in Quebec in the last election. The parties hope 
that putting pressure on the Liberals and the Bloc Québécois will net them more this time. Tom Perry, CBC News, Montreal. Afghanistan is another critical conversation on the campaign trail. Today, Justin Trudeau was asked whether he'd push for sanctions against the Taliban at tomorrow's G7 leaders meeting. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, the Taliban are already recognized uh, under Canadian law as a terrorist entity. Ottawa also confirmed today Canada's special forces are working outside the security cordon of Kabul's airport to get people out, Canadians and eligible Afghans. More than 1,700 have been airlifted on 13 flights. And the U.S. military says it got more than 10,000 people out over a 24-hour period that ended this morning. But Washington is under increasing pressure to keep its troops in the country longer than it said it will. Carolyn Dunn has the details. How are you? How are you? Stepping off a bus and into a new, undoubtedly overwhelming life. Some of the lucky Afghan families who have successfully been airlifted to safety. We are pushing the limits uh, to do everything we can to get every single evacuee uh, out of Kabul. But the throngs of people desperate to escape grow daily. Hope to be able to process all of them grows dim. Not when the nearly 6,000 U.S. troops running the international evacuation operation are set to pull out once and for all by month's end. So there's growing international pressure to extend that deadline and get more people out. The British Defence Secretary said Prime Minister Boris Johnson will raise an extension at an emergency G7 meeting on Afghanistan tomorrow. I don't think there is any likelihood on staying on after the United States. Uh, if their timetable extends even by a day or two, then that will give us a day or two more to evacuate people because we are really down to hours uh, now, not weeks. It's now time for us to stay. When asked, to Justin Trudeau didn't days, say whether he days. will ask for the U.S. to stay yeah, longer. We will uh, talk about what more we can do and how we can align to make sure we are saving as many people as possible. Our focus is on getting this done by the end of the month. This afternoon, the Pentagon uh, spokesperson said discussions about extensions uh, would happen if needed. We just aren't there right now. But Reuters is reporting the U.S. president is considering extending the withdrawal deadline. Decision on that tomorrow. May God protect our troops. Thank you. He didn't take any questions on that or on Afghanistan at all today. But the Taliban did issuing a warning that if the August 31st deadline for U.S. withdrawal is not met, there will be consequences. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. Now, the situation in Afghanistan is also concerning because of what may be allowed to grow under Taliban rule. Fears that this latest chapter will give rise to the kind of terror that changed global security 20 years ago. Thomas Daigle explains. It may now look like peace in these streets away from the airport in Kabul, but there's danger hiding in plain sight. Consider who was at this high-level meeting just days ago. Former Afghan President Hamid Karzai on the left, negotiating directly with the chief of the brutal Taliban offshoot, the Haqqani Network. Their leadership, a longtime target of the FBI after deadly attacks. This truck bombing four years ago near the German embassy in Kabul killed more than 150 people. And the Haqqanis are just one of the militant groups now emboldened by the Taliban's takeover. The number one concern is their strategic relationship with Al-Qaeda. Remember, the Taliban gave safe haven to Osama bin Laden to plan the 9-11 attacks. And Afghanistan hosted camps where Al-Qaeda would train children to fight highlighting the long-time ties between the militant group and the Taliban. This so former CSIS intelligence in analyst warns about that enduring really relationship. Whether or not the Taliban is in a position to dictate terms to al-Qaeda in the long term, I think remains to be seen and be ready for the possibility that al-Qaeda will try to launch attacks from Afghanistan. When the Trump administration struck a deal with the Taliban for U.S. troops to pull out, a key condition was this. The Taliban will prevent any group in Afghanistan from threatening the security of the United States and its allies and will prevent them from recruiting, training and fundraising. A promise that's left Western leaders unconvinced. Those now taking power have the responsibility to ensure that international terrorists do not regain a foothold. <laughs> 
For Afghans, though, there's a more imminent threat, with videos circulating purporting to show Taliban militants carrying out punishment in the streets and door-to-door -door raids. Nasreen Nava got out just before the Taliban arrived. It's a huge difference, like right now, if you compare just two weeks. And uh, we see that women uh, were beaten just because of their clothes. It's a nightmare for Afghanistan and a potential threat for the globe. The men with the guns are in charge now, but can't control what happens next. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Pfizer is the first vaccine in the United States to receive full approval, and officials hope that will help convince those who haven't gotten the shot to finally get it. So to know that the FDA has done its full process, I think will actually help move some people off the fence. Up next, can it drive a vaccination spike? And a little later, an ugly side of politics. There was one occasion where my tire was slashed. What diverse candidates face in a system already stacked against them. Plus, it's a choice no rancher wants to make. People have to get rid of cattle because there's nothing for them to eat and you can't let them starve. The extreme drought that is forcing them to sell. We're back in two. There was a political and media stampede, but the truth will out in time. Of that, I am confident. Well, in his last address on his last day in office, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo defended his reputation. Cuomo announced his resignation earlier this month after allegations he sexually harassed at least 11 women. U.S. drug regulators have now given their full approval to the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for Americans 16 and older. That goes beyond the existing emergency approval. And as Chris Reyes tells us, officials are really hoping it means more Americans will get vaccinated. A little over eight months after Pfizer became the first COVID-19 vaccine to get emergency use authorization from the FDA, the shot now has the government agency's full approval for anyone 16 years and older. As the first FDA-approved COVID-19 vaccine, the public can be confident that this vaccine meets the FDA's gold standards for safety, effectiveness, and manufacturing quality. To win the FDA's approval, the drug company presented the agency with more clinical trial data, including results from more than 40,000 participants. President Joe Biden used the announcement to argue for more vaccine requirements. If you're a business leader, a nonprofit leader, a state or local leader who has been waiting for full FDA approval to require vaccinations, I call on you now to do that. Require it. Okay, good morning, everybody. The Pentagon was quick to follow the president's lead. The department is prepared to issue updated guidance requiring all service members to be vaccinated. Health officials hope the FDA's decision will finally change minds about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. This term emergency use makes them feel as though it isn't reliable. And so to know that the FDA has done its full process, has approved it in the way that we approve many of our other technologies and medications to be used in healthcare systems, I think will actually help move some people off the fence. The U.S. gave out six million shots last week. More than half of the country is now fully vaccinated. It's the kind of progress the president has been desperate for, as states in the South struggle with a Delta variant surge. With today's FDA full approval, there's another good reason to get vaccinated. So, please get vaccinated now. No timeline was given for when the drug may be approved for kids under 12. It remains under emergency use authorization for those between 12 to 15 years old. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Now on the campaign trail, a lot has changed over the years, but diverse candidates still face huge obstacles. Sometimes it was explicit, sometimes it was implicit. Sometimes it was, you don't belong in this race, let alone this country. Up next, the struggle for real equality in politics. Plus, the moments of joy so many of us have lived for in this pandemic. A COVID reunion a long time coming.
Welcome back. Just over a week into the federal election, and already there has been racist vandalism on the campaign trail. Last week, multiple posters of two liberal candidates in Montreal were defaced with swastikas. That sparked condemnation from all major party leaders. But of course, as diverse candidates across the country know all too well, behavior like that isn't new. The National Special Correspondent Janelle Massa spoke with past, current and future politicians about the challenges people of color have faced and still struggle with as they work to get your vote. There it is. Behind the furnace, that's where it was, <laughs> covered under three inches of dust. It's been eight years since Ali Schaber knocked on doors in London, Ontario. To say no to increased taxes and yes to tax relief. Asking for voters to lend him their support. Now he's speaking out about the darker side of running for political office. What were some of the things you heard? Sometimes it was explicit, sometimes it was implicit. Sometimes it was Muslims don't belong in this race, let alone this country. Very direct comment. Some of my election signs were defaced with somebody spray painted terrorist on one of them. Ali ran for the Ontario Progressive Conservatives in 2011 and 2013. He says he never told the party or even his family about some of the vitriol he faced. He feared it would become a distraction from the issues he wanted to focus on. It means that you run the risk of being defined as that candidate. And you may have incredible ideas when it comes to policy on education or health care or fiscal policy or, or whatever it is. But nobody ever listens to that. After a deadly act of violence against a Muslim family in his hometown, Ali decided it was finally time to talk about what he'd experienced. While well, he says he expected some political opposition at the door, he didn't expect the racism to be so blatant. I do know definitively that people said to me directly, from their lips to my ears, uh, that uh, they would not be voting for um, any Muslim candidate, myself included. Ali didn't win, and he says he'd consider running again. But questions of safety come to mind. Candidates of colour can become targets. The front window of my uh, office was smashed in. Um, there was one occasion where my tire was slashed, uh, and that's a bit frightening. Jenny Kwan has been in politics for nearly 30 years. I'm so proud to be the first Chinese-Canadian woman ever elected to the B.C. legislature. Holding office at all three levels of government. But she's suffered personal insults for who she is along the way. My natural heritage is being mocked. She says racist attacks and hateful comments are getting more brazen. They are finding their voice more and more now. I've had to call the police on one occasion where someone came into the office, was absolutely belligerent and was racist, was sexist, misogynistic. Jenny's office is now equipped with panic buttons and staff are directed never to be alone. Was there ever a point where it deterred you and you thought, I don't know if I want to have to deal with this. It's just a bit of a shock to your system, always, every time. And then I thought, you know what? I am going to fight for this every step of the way. And people will not get to silence me. Because if they make me go away, they win. But getting in is no easy task for many candidates of colour. Jenny credits her former colleagues for helping her get a foot in the door. My mentor, the late Jim Green, chose not to run for the nomination in Vancouver, Mount Pleasant back in 1996 because he said, kiddo, I want you to run. Because sometimes we have to make space for people that don't look like me. 2021 election, here we come. It's those kinds of moves more parties need to be willing to make, says Karen Bird, a political science professor at McMaster who studies representation in the electoral system. It's not just about chasing the ethnic vote. Let's actually think about fairness and justice. Karen says Canada's political parties favour minority groups that are geographically concentrated. That's allowed South Asian candidates to succeed in certain suburbs, but doesn't necessarily apply to other, more dispersed communities. This doesn't function this way for, say, black Canadians who are, we don't find these kinds of mass, you know, big concentrations. Uh, I don't think that there's a riding in Canada that has more than 25% black population. And so the parties are less inclined to nominate a black candidate. And there's only been, in, in Canada's history since, since Confederation, we've only had three black federal cabinet ministers, if you think about that, right? So there's not a lot of representation. 
Velma Morgan runs Operation Black Vote Canada. For almost 20 years, she's been trying to get more black Canadians into politics. Challenges with fundraising and networking, she says, can hold many possible candidates back. Diversity is a nice, pretty picture, but inclusion means that I'm sitting at the decision-making table and my voice is just as valuable and powerful as a person sitting beside me. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Mr. Speaker, I have never felt safe or protected in my position, especially within the House of Commons. Racialized politicians have recently revealed the realities of life inside Parliament. Let me be honest, brutally honest, nice words with no action hurt when they are uttered by those with power. In June, Inuk MP Momulak Kakak announced she was leaving politics, expressing frustration at the government's inaction on issues concerning her community. She's not the only woman of colour to leave federal politics disillusioned. Former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavan says she felt tokenized and silenced. And a now independent Jody Wilson-Raybould says she won't be running for re-election, saying in a letter that Parliament has regressed, become more toxic and marginalizes certain communities. In the end, party discipline prevails in Canada. Party discipline is, is incredibly powerful. And that's a problem, says Karen, if the country is to move from symbolic representation to substantive representation. Representation means more than what she looks like what she identifies as. Do you feel like there is a lot of tokenism in politics? From time to time, yes. Bibi Hakim works for a Liberal candidate in Ontario. She hopes all political parties can move beyond diversity just for optics. I am half Muslim, half Hindu. So right off the bat, I check off that diversity bucket. But I don't just have that identity. I come from Etobicoke North, which my community experiences different things, from mental health to housing to issues with education or access to health care. So tell me a little bit about your background. For sure. so the child of Guyanese immigrants, Diana, Bibi dreams of one day running and eventually becoming... The first elected woman prime minister of Canada of colour. But for young candidates of colour to reach Canada's top office, Bibi says they need more support. And I think it, they need mentorship. Um, I'm considering myself very lucky, but looking at other young individuals and young people of colour, they don't have the same opportunity that I have come across. Despite having gone through her own experiences of racism, she believes that fighting to have voices like hers in office is vital. I think what motivates me is if I don't, who will? And I know for me representation matters. And she hopes the future House of Commons will better reflect the country. Janelle Massa, CBC News, Toronto. COVID restrictions have kept many of us from our loved ones, sometimes so close and yet so far. We would joke about standing on either side of the Niagara River and like throwing stuff at each other or waving so we could see each other. Up next, at long last, a real hug between best friends. First part in our series of pandemic reunions. And a little later, what are the odds of this? A chance overseas reunion between backpackers 18 years later. Welcome back. For many Canadians, the pandemic has brought long separations from loved ones. But slowly, those video calls are giving way to hugs. This week, the National will follow six reunions, each months in the making. Tonight, we head to Buffalo, New York, where a Canadian ER doctor finally makes a once routine trip across the border. On the other side, we'll lean forward and have a look. Bridge to Canada, three miles. I have not seen Katie in almost a year now, and I've been fully vaccinated for seven months at this point. Oh, there's the sign. I'm going to cry on this border guard. That's embarrassing. I pulled over to collect myself. So that's it. I'm <laughs> I'm in Canada. And I'm a bit of a disaster. Here we go. <laughs> Having Katie 
so close, but so far was so frustrating. My name is Johanna Innes. I am an emergency medicine physician. I live in Buffalo, New York, but I'm originally from Ottawa. Life during the pandemic has been difficult. Taking an already difficult job and adding a disease that we know nothing about and then adding border restrictions took a, a challenging job that maybe could have been offset by being around friends and family to a challenging job and being isolated from friends and family. Coming a little afternoon bike ride and there's Canada. I live in Buffalo and I work in Buffalo, but the majority of my friends and social and recreational activities happen in St. Catharines. I suspect it's probably a little obvious that a Canadian lives here. I mean, if you're anywhere near Hamilton, you have to have your Arkells pennant. My Canadian grocery supply is actually pretty good. Gotta have that Canadian jam. That's Margaret Catwood. Yeah, really. So I will be reuniting with my best friend, Katie. I met Katie playing hockey, and then she and her family took me in because I don't have any family in the Buffalo area. So for the last six years, she's been my closest friend, my support system. Her family is my family now. We would joke about standing on either side of the Niagara River and like throwing stuff at each other or waving so we could see each other. It really felt like she was on the other side of the world. So close, yet so far. This weekend, I'm going to St. Catharines to spend the day with Katie and her family to celebrate everything we've missed. So I just got off work. Um, I got out late. I'm on my way home. I'm going to update my ArriveCan app and I'm gonna put in my vaccine info so I can go home Sunday. The process of actually getting to Canada now is still not easy. Today, I have a COVID test at two o'clock and then I actually booked a second one tomorrow just in case at work. Thank you. Do you want both sides? No, that's it. Thanks. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, you too. Quick last minute panic check. Passport, COVID test, vaccine card. <sighs> Let's go. Every time I hit that border and see that welcome to Canada sign, it was like, whew, okay, great, I'm home. I haven't felt that feeling in a long time and I am ready for that. <sighs> I'm at Katie's house. Here we go. Oh my God. There's a banner that says, welcome home. Holy. I swear it's national TV. It's been a little, little bit. How are you? Doing? Oh, how are you? The, uh, necessary haircut. <laughs> Finally, oops. There's gonna be a lot of smiling, a lot of laughing. Our plan right now is to uh, just spend the day outside. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Yes! There's all these life events we missed that we're just gonna cram into one day the best we can. Yay. Happy Christmas, Yay. Easter, Thanksgiving, Yay. Happy day, every holiday. birthdays. That was a really good day. I needed this. My heart needed this. Really good day. We will have long-awaited pandemic reunions all this week on The National. Tomorrow, the story of a new Regina mother and her nearly year-long journey to reunite with her partner south of the border. Well, hot, dry conditions in many parts of the country are hitting farmers hard, especially in Manitoba. We'll have to get rid of cattle because there's nothing for them to eat and you can't let them starve. Up next, how drought-like conditions are pushing ranchers to the edge. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as we roll into week two of this summer election campaign, a look at the polls and how the major parties are faring thus far. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, cleanup has begun after Tropical Storm Henri slammed the northeastern U.S. It made landfall yesterday in Rhode Island, triggering flash flooding and knocking out power to tens of thousands of homes. 
The storm, downgraded now to a tropical depression, is expected to bring rain to Atlantic Canada tomorrow. Drink water. Don't, you have to drink water. If you have a neighbor that you know that is maybe more vulnerable, go check on that person. It's important. Meanwhile, people in southern Quebec and Ontario are dealing with record-breaking heat. There are several heat warnings in place across both provinces, which could stretch well into the week. With the Humidex, it fell close to 40 degrees at a point here in Toronto today. Now, the heat's been bad enough for farmers and ranchers, but drought has made things worse. It has been especially dry in the interlake section of central Manitoba. That's the area between Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Farmers there are in a desperate plight facing a horrible dilemma. The CBC's Jill Kubro has their story. Dry, no rain, grasshoppers, it's been terrible. That's how most farmers here describe 2021. Fields are barely sprouting anything. It's what brought Tom Clement here today. He's getting rid of a third of his livestock. There's just not enough pasture or hay to feed them. Heartbreaking, really. This is the third emergency sell-off at the Ashern Auction Mart since July. And summer sales like this are unprecedented. Auctioneer Buddy Bergner says there's no alternative. People have to get rid of cattle because there's nothing for them to eat and you can't let them starve. From morning to night, truck after truck arrive with cattle, more than a thousand in total. Normally calves wouldn't sell until later in the fall once they're weaned and bulked up for slaughter. Some generational family farms are selling off entire herds. There's people crying in the stands when their animals sell. There's people that are upset. Um, you get the whole spectrum of emotions when when it's a situation like this. West Interlake Reeve Arthur Yonison is a cattle rancher himself and knows what's at stake. These cows that are going through here now today, or you'll see later on, were probably purchased at $2,000 a piece. And these guys are going to be lucky to get $1,000 for those cows. The influx of cattle is also driving down sale prices. Buyers sit front row. Many are purchasing for feedlots in Alberta and Ontario, where cattle go to gain weight before slaughter. Yonison worries about the future of this region. Uh, the hardest part is that you're seeing the fabric of our communities unravel. It's, um, you're going to see young people leave and it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be tough for these communities going forward. Kirk Kiesman says this is the fourth money-losing year because of dry conditions. Four-year-old Asher would like to follow in his father's footsteps. That makes Kiesman proud and wary. It's a great lifestyle, um, but right now it's not, not the best business. Still, he and others will keep going for now and keep hoping for a better season next year. Jill Kubra, CBC News, Ashern, Manitoba. Next, a moment of fate after almost two decades. How these two backpackers reunited. Their story is next in our moment. Well, these two travelers last saw each other 18 years ago, but then in an airport in Ukraine just a few days ago, serendipity struck. So they just happened to be behind one another in the same line for the same flight. And tonight, their reunion is our moment. When I was 18, I backpacked through Australia. I had such an amazing experience, but I hadn't traveled by myself since then. So I decided to go to the Ukraine by myself. As I was leaving the Ukraine, I was flying to Croatia. And as I was going through the gate, this girl in front of me, she said, hey, are you... Ben Nempton. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's my name. Right away, I recognized her as this girl that I met when I was backpacking by myself in Australia. Immediately said, Ellie? I don't know why, because I haven't seen Ben for almost 20 years. I was like, oh my God, this is Ben. We were screaming and falling into each other's arms. We got champagne and we found two seats on the plane. They were empty, and then we just caught up for the rest of the trip. When we landed, we said, oh, it was good to see you. I'll see you eight, in 18 years. <laughs> really a magical moment. After 20 years, it's... It felt like one in a million. 
I think it's one in a million that they recognized each other after 18 years. Because I know some people don't change a lot, but some people change an awful lot. Well, Ellie said that she, as soon as she saw his Canadian passport, she was mm. like, I know what right. that has been. And that they didn't get a chance to say goodbye 18 years ago, and she sort of feels like this is destiny wow. sort of brought them together again. That's a heck of a story. That is a national for August the 23rd. Good night. Good night.